Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar, Racism's Roots in Medicine and How Implicit Bias Impacts Care. <clears throat> so thank you so much for joining us. My name is Vanessa Kittleson and I am on the quality management team at Hennepin Health in Minneapolis. So this webinar is presented to you by a collaboration of Minnesota Health Plans working together to ensure a healthy start for Minnesota children by concentrating on improving services provided to pregnant people and infants with a particular focus on reducing racial and ethnic disparities. The health plans collaborating in this project are Blue Plus, Health Partners, Hennepin Health, South Country Health Alliance, and UCARE. This work is done in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Human Services. The webinar will be recorded um, and is available for later viewing on the Stratus Health website. And the link to that page will be available <clears throat> on the final slide of the webinar. There will also be an evaluation for you to complete at the end of the presentation, and it will display as you log off. So if you complete the evaluation, you can also receive a certificate of participation. And during today's presentation, please submit your questions via chat. Our presenter will respond to questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. One minute, please. Probably should. Oh my God. All right, can folks see that? Hope so. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so I am honored today to introduce Dr. Nathan Chumolo. He is the medical director of Minnesota's Medicaid and Minnesota Care Programs. He also practices as a general pediatrician. There we go. A general pediatrician and internal medicine hospitalist with Park Nicollet Health Services Health Partners. He's a graduate of the University of Minnesota Medical School and was the pediatric chief resident at the U of M Children's Hospital. He is one of the early childhood champions for the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, where he also serves on the board of directors. Dr. Chumolo is an adjunct assistant professor of pediatrics at the U of M Medical School and co-founded the organization Minnesota Doctors for Health Equity. He serves on the board of directors of Reach Out and Read and the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement, as well as the steering committee of the Minnesota Perinatal Quality Collaborative. He's a leading voice in health equity, and his work has been recognized by Reach Out and Read, the city of Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights, and most recently, Minnesota physician named him one of the 100 most influential healthcare leaders in 2020. That's why we're so excited to learn from him today. So Dr. Chomolo, thank you so much for being here. Please, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, and happy to be here. So I, uh, for the last uh, year plus now, have um, included a uh, land acknowledgement in all my talks. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I gather in the Twin Cities is the seized territory of the Dakota people. And I think it's really important that um, as we come together, um, every time, but particularly with what's going on in our city and our state and our country, that we consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here together today. And so we're going to start by um, looking uh, and, uh, and reviewing the different levels of racism. Uh, we'll then move to discuss how medicine has historically and currently reinforces structural racism and um, how clinician education contributes to implicit racial bias. Look at how implicit racial bias impacts the care patients receive, and then look at uh, some of the ways Minnesota's Medicaid program is using racial equity frameworks to address birth outcome disparities. Uh, things I won't cover in depth, but I think it's really important that anyone that working in this space becomes familiar with are concepts like microaggressions, stereotype threat, white privilege, white hegemony, normativity, white fragility and weathering. Next slide. So when I went through medical training, um, uh, and even in many instances today, when you see uh, race talked about in the medical literature, it's often through this lens of disparities, right? Uh, we have looked at populations and we find that they have different outcomes and that race is one of the ways we can tell who's gonna have different outcomes. You can hit next, um, but what that really, uh, is getting at is more the symptom, right? Disparities are the symptom of a problem. And so just defining a disparity, um, just treating a symptom doesn't actually get to the underlying illness. 
and that's racism. And so when you hear the word racism, you usually think of these kind of overt acts of hatred and bigotry, right? Uh, like Charlottesville um, or like what happened with the Capitol insurrection. Um, we get it next. But racism is actually more uh, aptly defined as uh, more like an iceberg where those explicit acts of hatred and bigotry are really the kind of tip uh, things that are easily seen, but underneath the service, it acts and impacts our lives in so many different ways, some that we are aware of, um, uh, and some that and many that we are not, and the systems and structures that are at play. And so I think it's important to have some definitions and a framework when we're talking about racism uh, in this setting. And so uh, the three, uh, the, the framework that I really uh, Use and 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 uh, um, uh, used to kind of help uh, shape how racism is a public health crisis is that that was uh, developed and um, uh, published by Dr. Kamara Jones. So Dr. Jones is a public health um, PhD epidemiologist as well as a physician. She's a former president of the American Public Health Association. And over 20 years ago, she described racism working on three different levels: institutionalized racism personally mediated racism and internalized racism. And she does a beautiful job. Actually, you wanna go back. Um, she does a beautiful job really talking about it through the lens of uh, a gardener's tale or an allegory. Uh, and so I'm not gonna uh, do it justice in going through the allegory itself, but it really kind of talks and really kind of helps connect how racism works in our lives in these three different levels. And we'll really be focusing mostly on institutionalized and personally mediated racism in this talk. But I really like her overall definition of racism uh, as it being a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Now you can go next slide. And so when uh, we're looking at definitions, racial bias, therefore, is really more of a form of implicit bias, which refers to attitudes, stereotypes that affect the individual's understanding and decisions in an unconscious manner. And racial bias, therefore, is more along the lines of some personally mediated forms of racism. Next slide. And then privilege, I think it's important to uh, identify here. And I like this you know, definition of you know, privilege doesn't mean your life hasn't been hard, it just means that when we're talking about white privilege is your skin color isn't one of the things that make it harder. I also have male privilege. Doesn't mean that for other reasons, you know, my life hasn't had difficulties and, uh, and obstacles, but my uh, gender that I uh, was assigned at birth that I identify with hasn't been one of the things making it harder. And so for context, I think it's really important to take a broad look and think throughout the course of our history, as uh, historian Evelyn Hammonds notes, there has never been any period where the health of blacks was equal to that of whites, that disparity has been built into our system. Next slide. And so when we look at how that shows up in medicine um, and the roots of how medicine has been tied to racism throughout the course of our country, we can look back into the 19th century when prominent physicians were sought to establish the physical peculiarities of uh, different races to justify the institutions of slavery and the institutions of land seizure. And so on the right there, you see uh, charts that were drawn up of different head sizes and shapes and that based off of that, you could determine someone's uh, potential and whether or not they uh, could have certain rights or not, uh, whether certain rights could be denied or not uh, in our society. And physicians were uh, at the base of defining that type of uh, science, what was called science at that time. And then on the left, uh, you see a picture uh, that's really uh, connected to obstetrics and gynecology. Um, and so the physician who is the gentleman on the right of that picture uh, is Jane Marion Sims, uh, who for a long time has been held to be one of the fathers of obstetrics and gynecology. Um, and he got that fame and notoriety in part by developing a procedure that helps correct fistulas between women's bladders and vagina after they had childbirth. He developed that procedure by experimenting on the enslaved women. Um, and, uh, and so what you see is a picture of a woman uh, whose name is believed to be Anarka. 
um, and is believed that she underwent 30 different surgeries while being enslaved by Jane Marion Sims without anesthesia at a time when anesthesia was the standard of care. And if you are looking closely on the left side of the picture, you see two other women peeking from behind the sheet. And so Anarka was just one of many women that Jane Marion Sims uh, performed surgeries on without anesthesia to develop his procedures. And so that's part of the history of medicine that I did not learn when I was in medical school. I did not learn when I was in residency. I learned that um, uh, on my own after training. And it, if for us to continue to address racism and medicine, we really need to know uh, what the history is and how that plays out. Go next. And so, um, you know, mistrust isn't just from human rights abuses like what Jane Marion Sims did, like things like the Tuskegee experiment. It really is passed down from perceptions, the medical perception, the medical profession has uh, propagated about African Americans and others uh, based off of race. And so this is from a volume of JAMA published in 1899. You can hit next. And what you notice is that in this part of the, the journal, it's talking about diseases of the ear, nose, and throat. Um, and it hit next again. It described them as you know, a, a, a population or community that afford ample opportunity to study the natural history of disease without treatment. So this was in 1899, you know, even well before the Tuskegee experiment, which uh, bore that out. And then you continue yeah, next again and um, next one more time and describes um, the patients in the journal as unwieldy, unwilling, unsatisfactory, right? Um, and so this is how uh, people in our community were talked about in the medical literature, you know, for uh, decades, right? And, and then even when you fast forward to today, with the last month, JAMA had a podcast that was basically dismissing structural racism and the impact that that has as well. You can hit next. And so you uh, see a cycle of how racism impacted our roots. And so for a long time, uh, black students weren't even allowed access to medical schools. And then once they did form, and once our communities formed our own medical schools, black physicians weren't allowed entrance into organizations like the AMA, which were at the time really required to get credentialed and practice in hospitals and clinics, even in their own communities. How we built our hospitals, particularly in areas of the South where there are most of our African American citizens live, um, was allowed to segregate. And so the separate but equal clause that uh, was famous in the Brown v. Board of Education for education was actually allowed when hospitals were built for much of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And then even the whole fact that our healthcare system is based off of employer-based insurance. That's how the majority of folks get access to healthcare in our system. And that was built um, it, in a way that those, what are the jobs that have access to those type of benefits? There are jobs that um, many people in our community were black, indigenous, and other communities were barred from getting access to. And so, you know, structural medicine is really baked into uh, the roots of medicine in our healthcare system. Get it next. But when we look at uh, how our clinicians are trained and our physicians are trained in particular, we see how some of those ideas of kind of biological difference uh, between black and white uh, um, uh, citizens really are continuing to propagate today. And so this is a study that was looking at all the lectures at a US medical school uh, done in two, two, uh, 2015. And they had um, the students and, and faculty go through and kind of code when race was talked about in those first two years, in those lectures in those first two years. And they said, when race is talked about, is it talked about as a social and structural construct like it is? Or is it talked about as an explicit biological difference that because someone's skin is darker than someone else's, I know how their kidneys work and I know how their lungs work differently as well. Um, or is it an implied biological difference that because of someone's uh, skin color, I know that their, their risk is related to this biological process. And what they found looking at all those lectures in those first two years is that 96% of the time, race is described as either an explicit or implied biological difference. Um, and that is how our medical students are being trained even in many cases to this day. Next slide. 
Uh, also done in 2015, but not related to that previous study, was a study looking at the impact of that type of education, right? And so if you're being told over and over that race is an implied or explicit biological concept, you start to internalize these ideas of biological difference. And so how does that show uh, up in practice? Um, this uh, study looking at racial bias and pain assessment and treatment recommendations and false beliefs about biological difference was done also in 2015, published in 2016. They looked at two arms of individuals. One was looking at white laypersons with no medical training and asked to uh, identify um, in certain scenarios, how would you feel if you experienced pain how would you imagine other people? How would you imagine other people uh, would feel if they had felt pain in certain scenarios, like getting your hand slammed in the door, for example? And then the second study was looking at white medical students and residents, and residents from multiple programs, not specifically defined. Um, and they had then those medical uh, professionals or medical trainees look at mock case reports about a black patient and a white patient, and then asked to make pain ratings, and then also do assessments of their treatment. Next slide. And so um, this uh, study has gotten a lot more attention in the last couple of years. And so you probably uh, have likely heard the impact here or what was found, but you know, many concerning things were found in this study. 50% you know, of students, residents believed at least one of these statements was a possible or probably or definitely true about biological difference between black and white individuals uh, with at least one second year medical student believing that whites have larger brains than blacks. A quarter of second year students believe that blacks age more slowly than whites and then hit next. The big kind of um, takeaway that's been uh, repeated more is that 40% of first year, 42% of second year and 25% of residents believe that black skin was thicker than white skin, right? And so this is in 2015. So overall, the more someone endorsed a belief about biological differences between whites and blacks, the more likely they were to rate pain experienced by blacks lower than whites. And if you also endorse more of those beliefs, you had less accuracy in your pain treatment recommendations. Right? And so we see a direct tie to how we talk about race um, and how our students are educated about it and how that then ends up uh, ref being reflected in their own pain assessments and treatment. And so when we look at um, personally mediated by uh, mediated racism, kind of transitioning to how structural racism has influenced the training uh, and, and how that then now impacts the personally mediated racism um, that uh, is carried through in our, in our interactions with patients, you know, really focused, the literature is really focused on implicit bias, which is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. You can hit next. The way that this has uh, often been measured is the IAT, Implicit Association Test, uh, which measures the time it takes subjects to match representatives of certain social groups. So looking at different uh, races, for example, to particular attributes. And so you can see you know, words like good, bad, cooperative, stu stubborn, and it tries to then um, uh, actually measure unconscious bias by kind of hypothesizing that subjects match a group representative to an attribute more quickly if they connect these factors in their minds subconsciously. So that's what you'll see in much of the litter is how did individuals do on the IAT to kind of understand what was their baseline level of implicit bias or unconscious bias. Next slide. And so what we've seen for some time is that there is a no implicit bias around pain management in particular. So this study is done from 2000, looking at um, uh, black and white children in the emergency department, looking to get um, treatment for a long bone fracture. So that's a population children that aren't really known to come into the emergency department setting, you know, looking for narcotics or malingering. And you have a very objective reason uh, for them to need pain control with you have a, a long bone fracture identified. And what they found is that black patients were significantly less than white patients to receive pain medication for fractures in the emergency department, despite having similar reports of pain. In fact, the risk of receiving no pain medication while in the ED was 66% greater for black children than white children in that study. You can hit next. 2015, JAMA had a study looking at uh, nearly 1 million children diagnosed with appendicitis, uh, and again, found similar studies where, or similar results where black patients were less likely to receive any pain medication for moderate pain and were less likely to receive opioids for severe pain. 
And we see this um, also show up in how our interactions are. Um, implicit bias can impact our interactions with patients. And so this study was looking at the associations of clinicians' implicit attitudes about race with their communication and looking specifically at verbal dominance, which is um, uh, a uh, ratio, verbal dominance is a ratio of the clinician to patient statements. And so uh, a, a interaction is more verbally dominant if there really isn't space for the patient to talk. It's just the clinician talking over and over. And so um, you hit next. So uh, interaction that's more verbally dominant is more of like, you know, doctor knows best. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do versus more of a collaborative approach of, you know, here's what the results are saying. Here's what I recommend. You know, what do you think is um, the best plan forward? And so in this study, uh, clinicians did the IAT um, to kind of find out where their uh, uh, baseline was. And then they had them do mock interviews and mock um, interactions with white and black patients. And what they found is that clinicians who had a bias on the IAT towards white preference demonstrated more verbal dominance when talking to black patients than when they talked to white patients. Um, and then they also asked those mock patients, you know, what was your understanding of the plan? You know, how did the communication go for you? And what they found as a result, those who experienced the more verbal dominant interactions actually had uh, less understanding of the plan. So there was poor communication and they had um, uh, more discomfort with the interaction. And so there was this feeling of uh, less satisfactory care as well. And so this uh, idea of verbal dominance being influenced by our implicit biases impacts the very communication we have with our patients. Next. And then uh, we see physician implicit bias show up in uh, outcomes in, in hospital medicine. And so this one was looking specifically at um, use of thrombolytics um, uh, in uh, patients presenting um, for a, a heart attack. And so it was looking at, um, you can hit next, looking at uh, emergency medicine, internal medicine residents who took the implicit association test and then responded to the same clinical vignette on a patient with um, uh, ACS or a uh, heart attack, um, uh, except, um, you know, next, thank you. Um, no expressed, um, expressed explicit uh, preference. And so no one had really kind of was found to express an explicit preference for white or black patients, um, but there was some notable implicit bias uh, for white preference, next. And then there's no implicit bias for black stereotypes is less cooperative and uh, generally and less cooperative with medical procedures. So the idea that even if I told them that they should do this, they, they, they would be less cooperative. And what they found in this study is the stronger one's white preference was the more likely they would treat white patients and not black patients with the standard of care if they were presenting with heart attack symptoms, right? So again, showing that our implicit uh, bias actually impacts the care recommendations we give. A couple uh, interesting things about uh, this was, you know, the paradox of race consciousness. And so, you know, when you actually had them do the different case vignettes, 30% of residents thought that the white patient was likely to have coronary disease, but 40% thought the black patient was likely to have coronary disease. So actually residents more correctly identified that the black patients uh, more frequently were had coronary disease needed intervention. But then when you came to the next step of actually offering treatment, 60% of residents were very likely to offer treatment to white patients uh, versus only 40% very likely to offer treatment to black patients, right? Um, and so th there's just this paradox that we re realize that race puts could be potentially a marker of disadvantage because of structural racism, but then we don't follow that up with the appropriate uh, therapy recommendations, at least in this study was the recognition. And so uh, you can kind of click through all of the, yeah, those one more there. Yeah. So you can see in, in physician, uh, in hospital medicine, we've seen instances in cardiac catheterization, cardiac stents, um, uh, bypass surgery for cardiac disease, TPA uh, use in thrombolytics and stroke and the standard care pneumonia all have shown uh, uh, evidence that implicit bias does impact outcomes. Next slide. And so, in, and so if we look at uh, prenatal and obstetric care, we see evidence as 
that as well. And so uh, what you're looking at here is a graph looking at um, severe maternal uh, morbidity over the course of uh, uh, several years, uh, over a decade uh, in California. Um, and so this study looked at disparities in uh, severe uh, maternal morbidity prevalence and trends using linked birth certificate delivery discharge uh, records um, from 1997, 2014. Um, and you can see the gaps that have persisted to that time. So that top line are black birthing persons. The next line is a combination kind of blend of Hispanic, but we're still on the graph, Hispanic and um, Asian Pacific Islanders. And then the bottom line are white birthing persons. And so what they found in this study is that the prevalence, you know, varied considerably by race, but increased at a similarly rate among different race and ethnic categories, even though there were changes in comorbidity prevalence, changes in cesarean birth and other factors, um, it, it really didn't explain the disparities that persisted. And, and one finding was that black women with a college degree were two times higher than uh, white women with a high school diploma to have severe maternal morbidity. Um, and, and so this just kind of shows how that's, this has persisted over time. And so it's not just these underlying issues of income or education um, uh, or even underlying comorbidities that lead to these differential health outcomes. There has to be an actual underlying way that uh, women are treated differently um, that leads to many of these disparities as well. Next slide. Uh, a very clear example of this has been shared by two of the wealthiest and well-known women in the world uh, who are also black. And so, you know, Beyonce has described her experience in having uh, preeclampsia and emergency C-section and having some issues with communication throughout that process. Um, Serena Williams um, had even more explicit uh, uh, examples of where she experienced uh, implicit bias. Uh, having had a C-section, and even though she has a known history of a blood clotting disorder, um, having to uh, basically demand to get a CT scan to look for a PE um, from her providers, um, uh, and then uh, suffering a complication you know, of that treatment with wound dehiscence and a large hematoma and having to be in bed rest for six weeks afterwards. Um, and during that time, um, having to... Uh, uh, really uh, fight for her own pain management and, and get the pain management and control she needed at that time as well. And so even two of the wealthiest, well-known Black women in the world who are suffering complications shows us that it's it's not just about education. It's not just about access to, to, to you know, money or other things. There really is some uh, implicit bias that's at play that uh, we need to continue to work on. And like we talked about with um, pain control and, and pediatrics, we've seen you know, similar uh, results in studies in obstetrics. Um, and so this is a retrospective cohort study of women who underwent a C-section with a single live newborn um, in 2014 through 2016. They looked at pain scores um, uh, and medication administration at 24 hours and 48 hours. And what they found is that even though severe pain was more commonly documented, among Black and Hispanic women than white and Asian women. You know, black, Hispanic, and Asian women were less likely to have their pain um, assessed or uh, at 24 and 48 hours and were less likely to receive narcotic pain medications, uh, even though they were more likely to receive a report that severe pain. And then we also know that explicit bias and racism also Im can impact pregnancy, right? And so we've talked um, about implicit bias, and now we'll talk a little bit more about explicit bias. And so, you know, looking at population levels that women, Black women um, who've experienced, or Black birthing persons who've experienced explicit racism or discrimination, as well as there's evidence among you know, Hispanic uh, birthing persons in communities where there's been an ice raid in um, Arab American uh, birthing persons after 9-11 who experienced um, uh, explicit racism that if you look out uh, at their births, um, they see uh, they have uh, more low birth weights amongst populations where there's been these surges of uh, uh, discrimination or explicit um, uh, racism. And then additionally, there was uh, this uh, on, uh, the 
a study that looked at an online cross-sectional survey of lived experiences of maternal care um, uh, and looking at uh, what women actually experienced and how that impacted their perception of their care and their outcomes. And they found that 30% of Black and Hispanic women um, reported some form of mistreatment during their hospitalization for birth compared to 21% of white women. Um, there were certain factors that were found to be a lower likelihood of mistreatment like vaginal birth, uh, midwifery, um, if they're older than 30 or have had a previous pregnancy or being white. And then race was linked to worse treatment regardless of income. Um, and in, in, in addition, in fact, they also found that if you even had a partner who was black, that increased the reported uh, mistreatment. And so um, the dismissals of women um, who felt they had legitimate concerns and symptoms, um, such as preeclampsia and hypertension, can really start to help explain the existence of many of these poor birth outcomes that we see, um, even for Black women with the most, adva most advantages. Next slide. And then I'm um, thinking about the context of explicit uh, racism as well in, and as, as far as uh, the impact on chronic stress and how that could potentially impact um, uh, birthing persons. You know, uh, Rachel Hardiman and others have done some work looking at police brutality and mistrust in medical institutions. And so looking at you know, respondents in their study who had negative encounters with the police, um, even if they perceived these encounters to be necessary, had higher levels of medical mistrust you know, compared to those with no negative police encounters. And any uh, witnessing or experiencing of police brutality increased mistrust for all groups. Um, and and her, her work has continued to look at how police violence, you know, could impact the health of Black infants through those roles of chronic stress, where, uh, again, whether it's directly or in your community, experiencing police violence increases your own stress levels, that increases um, the, uh, you know, chronic toxic stress that then can impact things like low birth weights, premature births, and that can uh, really impact your whole life trajectory. And so what we see here is that, you know, systemic racism can impact impact health indirectly um, because what it leads to is, you know, less trust in institutions. Um, and this could impact how often mothers and birthing persons actually seek care or trust the care that they get um, or uh, understand and, and follow, um, you know, recommendations for their care. And so really thinking about how living in a community that repeatedly experiences, you know, things like police violence impacts the health um, uh, of our, our, our birthing persons. And so um, we've covered a lot of ground and, and um, kind of detailed a lot of the issues of how racism kind of gets baked into our systems from the start um, and how that can impact our implicit um, uh, bias and, and, and the care that our uh, birthing persons receive, as well as the explicit racism our communities experience and how that impacts our health. And so when we were thinking of how to address structural racism through our health systems, you know, where should we really start? And so first thing I'd like to point out is, you know, continuing to uh, help lift the difference between equality and equity, right? And so yeah, equality is everyone gets the same thing, no matter what their need is. Equity is those who have higher needs, who have higher risks, actually get more so that the opportunity to meet your trajectory is the same. And you know, equity is what we're really striving for, not equality. You can hit next. And so, um, yep. And so you think about a couple of the different things as an institution that we can be looking at. You know, are we applying a racial equity lens to all policies and decisions? We'll talk a little bit about what a racial equity lens looks like. Where, how do we expend, expand, or contract resources? And so how are we taking the racial equity impact in some of these decisions around buildings and clinics and staff? How do we use quality measures and what do we use as quality measures? How do we look at providing reimbursement for services and how are we um, taking into effect those uh, folks that we are um, uh, engaging in uh, offering services to our, our patients and our enrollees? Next. 
And then how do we support access and how do we recognize, um, you know, even if we have an insurance card, that doesn't necessarily mean we have access to the clinic that we can get to just with transportation or we have access to the provider that understands us and provides us the culturally appropriate care that we need. And so how do we really support access among multiple levels of racial equity? And so um, when we're talking about bringing a racial equity lens to our decision making, um, there are a lot of great tools out there. And so the one that I've been using a lot in our work with DHS and other areas in the community um, is the Government Alliance on Race and Equities Racial Equity Tool. And what it does is it helps you when you're having a decision, when you're starting a, pro a program, trying to implement or evaluate a policy, you know, first stop and ask several sets of questions. You know, what does the data tell you about existing racial inequities that influence people's lives that should be taken into consideration? And if you don't know that answer, maybe the first step of your pro progress or your, your program is to go and find that data and, and answer that question. And then once you have that, thinking about what are the root causes or factors that create these racial inequities, how the policy program budget thing that you are addressing increase or decrease racial equity? Um, how are you gonna potentially in, uh, address unintended consequences? And really, how are you bringing community in from the beginning? How are you gonna then have them help influence and inform the decision? And then how are you gonna be held accountable for the impacts on communities? Next slide. And so we'll go through uh, at the end here, just an example of what we're doing at the uh, Minnesota Department of Health along those lines. And so um, if you look uh, at birth disparities in Medicaid enrollment in Minnesota, we see that when we look at preterm births and low birth weights that we have disparate outcomes for our Native American and black birthing persons versus white persons in Minnesota. And then when you look at you know, how we cover or who uh, gets how birthing persons get healthcare coverage in Minnesota, we find that eight out of 10 Minnesota's black birthing persons are covered by Minnesota healthcare programs and nine out of 10 of in Minnesota's indigenous birthing persons are insured by Minnesota healthcare programs. And so if we're really trying to address the racial inequity in births, we need to have Medicaid at the table, right? That's what uh, looking at that data tells us from the beginning. And so the integrated care for high-risk pregnancies program through uh, the DHS um, uh, it works with community on, um, started in 2015 um, uh, when the legislature directed us to implement an initiative to really look at using perinatal care collaboratives, grant funds, um, and community to promote integrated care and enhance services to women at risk for um, out, uh, adverse outcomes of pregnancy. So get it next, I'm sorry. Yep, next. Um, and so the goal was to decrease birth disparities directly uh, by supporting African-American and American Indian communities through a community co-created and co-led approach, um, uh, looking at models that really help mitigate psychosocial risk, integrate and strengthen pathways and partnerships between mothers, community organizations, clinics, community health workers, and doulas, and I should have on their fathers too. Okay, next. Um, so you know, by focusing on where we saw disparities in birth outcomes, we've been able to focus on specific communities. And so um, uh, we call this program Belovedly iChirp, um, and it has uh, initially funding, had initially funding for both uh, black community and our tribal communities. Um, and so the Healthy Black Pregnancies is a part of um, the iChirp uh, coalition. And then initially there was funding for um, indigenous tribes in Northern Minnesota, the Fond du Lac Nation, um, of Lake Superior Chippewa, the Leech Lake Nation of Ojibwe, the Mille Lacs Nation of Ojibwe, uh, and the White Earth Nation of Chippewa and Red Lake Nation of Chippewa Indians were involved initially. Next. And so with the African-American iTRIP, um, with, helps from, with help from consultants from the community, um, what we were able to do is gather a community-led advisory board that facilitated conversations with mothers experiencing gaps in care and kind of identified solutions and a model with uh, several areas of focus, looking at strengthening community, enhancing pregnancy um, uh, and family support, um, including fathers and promoting healthy babies. Next slide. And so this work resulted in a hub of wellness model to link the African-American iTRIP work between the community and medical professionals and their grantees in a way that really centered culturally appropriate care 
um, and the African American Babies Coalition was really the, the main grantee that helped with a lot of the community engagement and coordination um, and looking at different messaging through you know, trusted community messengers and partners, looking at engaging multiple levels of the community, have a, both with uh, how you could connect with these resources, but even just you know, the importance of healthy pregnancies, um, early childhood, um, fatherhood, um, those type of you know, connections and supports. Next slide. Um, and then the model itself on the care delivery side, there's a lot of different um, tools that our grantees have used. So there's been patient care navigators, uh, cultural connectors and brokers. Um, there's both traditional OB visits, but also um, kind of a group care uh, in kind of creating these um, uh, networks of mothers. Um, and so you've seen examples of that, of um, uh, new diva, uh, which is um, Nubian moms and diva moms, uh, which have combined recently to help um, connect women to other women in the community who are going through pregnancy and have that kind of create that help, that community-based care and support model. Um, there's case management, there's um, home and community-based visits, um, there's uh, sub labor support, doula care, there's even rounding at regions hospitals specifically with uh, the diva moms. And then during COVID-19, there's been uh, telehealth visits built into it as well. Next slide. Um, and sorry, I should say that the, the grantees for those last two was Minnesota Community Care and Open Cities. So it's two of our fairly qualified health centers. Uh, North Point, uh, another one of our fairly qualified health centers, is another grantee. And they've also, um, they're, they're doing uh, programs like that. But I also like to highlight here how they've looked at both internal and external referrals into their ITERP program. And so internally, when uh, folks, mothers, fathers, other community members are identified as you know, being, uh, being pregnant, they can connect them to the iChirp um, program, whether they're interacting with the Food Shelf, the African American Men Project, the Gateway Program, um, at any of their extension clinics. And they've also developed external relationships where other uh, partners in the community can learn about iChirp um, and then refer their patients in for these kind of um, uh, uh, support services. They continue to get their obstetric Met care in their clinical care uh, at their their you know base clinic, but then they get this support service and this culturally competent service um, through the ITRIP program, and so kind of connecting those relationships both for internal referrals and external referrals. I'll touch uh, quickly on what the tribal nations did when they first joined um, ITRIP. Their program was a little bit different in that it was formed to uh, either create or enhance existing collaboratives that focus more specifically on mothers uh, and birthing persons suffering from substance use disorder. Um, and so uh, they uh, worked with DHS to kind of create three broad objectives for their initiatives, screening and assessment, joint accountability and shared outcomes, and then services for pregnant women, substance exposed infants and their family. Um, and approaches varied by tribe as they set up their collaboratives to kind of maximize their own resources and strengths. Uh, but there were some essential features of them, uh, ensuring that culture was at the core of the policy programming and daily interactions, utilizing peers with lived experience, keeping and treating families together as a unit and preventing the trauma of family separation, eliminating stigma associated with substance use disorder, and then breaking down silos through improved coordination and collaboration between and within uh, tribal nations and uh, county uh, and other supports. And so, and then really engaging the support of tribal leadership from the start. And so um, ITRIP has, is a really wonderful opportunity as a model uh, to be scaled up because it's really truly co-designed and community-led uh, collaborative care model that has demonstrated success in mitigating psychosocial risks during pregnancy for African-American women and, and our um, uh, tribal birthing persons. Um, it's improved care models for women and spouses with successful birth outcomes and less family disruption for those that have participated in the program with authentic community engagement and awareness. It is still a pilot program, and so there hasn't been the funding or the uh, scale to really measure these impacts on a community level. And so as we're moving forward, the uh, plan is as we scale it up to really start building in those processes of evaluation to monitor for more community level impacts. Excuse me. So um, when we think uh, about, and so that we really touched on a lot of kind of structural ways to really try to really 
address um, you know, racism and uh, instructional racism in obstetrics. When we think about personally mediated racism, several places uh, to start, the um, uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, several years ago actually put out a policy statement on their commitment to addressing racial bias and discrimination and its impact on patients. And so a lot of these things you'll find in other parts, places in the literature talking about how do you really get at addressing, you know, implicit bias. You know, first thing is you need to be aware of your own and bias, looking at how and in, in what settings um, it can impact uh, the health outcomes of the uh, birthing persons and, and communities you treat. Uh, looking into um, what is actually going on with your communities and what are the barriers they see, um, and then how do you integrate this into just your normal processes, and how do you engage uh, as a normal part of your process with community and have that ongoing feedback um, and, and creating an ongoing connection so that it's not just a one-off thing. You can't just do an implicit bias training one time and feel like, okay, that's done. It really is an iterative process that requires ongoing um, reflection and evolution. And so I like to always talk about my own path to becoming anti-racist. Um, and, and I like to use, again, another analogy from Dr. Tamara Jones, who talks about being on this moving walkway, you know, that you might be reminded of, of about that we do in airports back in the day when we would go to airports more frequently. And she says that the way our system and our society is structured is that we're all on a moving walkway that's heading towards a racist outcome because of structural racism. And so once we understand that, then we can kind of pick our head up, look around, see how racism is acting, and then turn around and start walking back the other way and walking against where uh, our moving walkway is taking us towards. And in that process, we might bump into some folks and help them understand along the way. And there might be some a little uncomfortable uh, encounters as we're going through that, but that's also important if we're really trying to move to become more actively anti-racist. And so in addition you know, to advocating for anti-racism training and continuing to examine my own biases. So um, the last uh, pieces here is really to drive home that addressing implicit bias alone is not enough. And so I like this um, uh, graphic from the National Equity Project that looks at it, really the linkage between implicit bias and structural racism. Um, and so we know that um, implicit bias has led to many policies and practices like we saw with, even within medicine, but within our society more broadly, that actually leads to inequitable outcomes and differences. But that, and so that's that structural racism piece. But what then happens is that we grow up in a society where we see these differences, and then it's told to us that these differences are is somehow inherent and biological, uh, and that people are this way because of their own values and not because of the opportunities they've uh, experienced or not experienced. And so then that understanding leads to us to continue to make policies and procedures with that understanding, which then continues to lead to more inequitable outcomes. And so if we only address one of those, we're not gonna really break this cycle and really need to be able to address both implicit bias and structural racism. And really understand that we can't really talk about equity without dismantling structural racism because structural racism is intersectional. Every uh, um, population uh, is impacted by structural racism whether they have another uh, issue of disadvantage or structural inequity that they're dealing with as well. And so we really need to address structural racism whenever we're talking about equity. And then lastly, that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So this isn't just about um, helping out a disadvantaged group. This is really about what we need to do to really realize our potential um, as a society. And that's one piece from Dr. Kamara Jones's quote that I really uh, hope we all take to heart today. At this point, I'll wrap up um, and take any questions, but thank you. Thank you, sorry. Uh... I got a little ahead of things on the last slide there. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Chomolo, are you able to see the comments? I can go ahead and um, read you the first one. Um, do you think that the perception that BIPOC individuals experience pain differently than white individuals has positive correlations with why it isn't common practice to get pain medication prior to IUD insertions or removals as the majority of women who choose that form of birth control are not white? Do you have ideas for how medicine can make structural shifts that can dismantle some of the structural racism and systemic racism in medicine? 
Yeah, that's a, a great observation. I think that's a great way of modeling how you can look at how you know racism might be acting where you're at, and um, and I, I don't know the any literature that defines that. That's why or why not pain medications uh, offered in uh, IUD placement, but um, I, I would certainly think that there is a strong likelihood that if you know IUDs when they first um, were introduced were primarily intended for uh, non-white birthing persons, um, uh, non-white women that it likely did factor in, um, whether explicitly or implicitly, because there has been this long um, uh, biological perception that black uh, folks have a different pain tolerance than white folks that directly ties to the institution of slavery and the justification of slavery. So, um, so yeah, so I think that is a great observation. And I think um, uh, if there isn't, you know, evidence and research delving into that, that would be a great place to start. But I don't think you need to start. I think that's good to do to spread the word about it. Um, but in your own practice, uh, if you see that opportunity, I think uh, changing your structures to make sure that women get the pain control they need would be really critical. Great. Um, <clears throat> the next question, this is a great question. How are health plans and or DHS being held accountable for the continuous training, not just one or two hour webinar, of the providers in their network to decrease their implicit bias and testing their implicit and explicit bias over the years? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, internally within DHS, we do have a, um, a chief health equity um, uh, officer that is looking at uh, embedding, and we're um, on the leadership team that's helping embed anti-racism trainings, um, implicit bias trainings, uh, um, uh, cultural inventories um, to make them the standard of our workflow, and then also. Uh, within how we develop our own policies and our budget proposals, doing racial equity assessments and making that the standard. Um, uh, and so that's in work internally. Um, you know, externally, we just put out an RFP for um, our children and uh, family services. Um, and we really tried to make a, an effort in the section that looks at addressing some of the social determinants of health of asking uh, those who will be working with to demonstrate to us to what extent they look in their own systems to address anti-racism and, um, and, and structural racism, and then to what extent do they look at the providers that they contract with, what the extent do they look at the um, uh, third party uh, vendors that they're working with that might be delivering services to our enrollees uh, and having that as part of that initial process and eventually you know, part of contracting, I think is an important step in accountability. Um, and, and, and that's kind of the, the carrot or stick, whatever way you want to look at it, that we have when we are looking at how we engage with our partners around this work. Um, and so what do you see coming next for partnering healthcare providers and systems with the communities we serve? Are there plans at MDH for expanding programs like iChurch so it's available to all hospitals? Yeah, that's one of my key goals um, in the next couple uh, hopefully years in this position is to really make ITRIP the standard of care for all, you know, Black and Indigenous birthing persons in Minnesota. You know, first, obviously, trying to get it so that all uh, who are served by our Minnesota healthcare programs can access it, but ideally, you know, all uh, uh, Black and Indigenous birthing persons can access that type of culturally centered care. So there's a proposal that was part of the governor's budget um, to do that exactly, to help um, fund the increased scaling up of the program, to also uh, establish some tribal hubs um, in uh, the Midgey area, the, uh, the Twin Cities and the Duluth area. Um, since those uh, tribal ITRIPs initially were uh, funded for SUD specific focus um, and, and to expand their, um, their focus to be very similar to the African-American ITRIP ones. And so, so yeah, that's definitely amongst my chief priorities is to have that type of care be accessible. And then there's other ways that we can also, you know, continue to improve care through, uh, you know, culturally appropriate midwifery care, doula care, uh, community health workers. And so we're looking at those options as well. Well, I would say that, you know, we also have looked with the um, 
American Rescue Plan funding um, uh, of a way to kind of scale up programs uh, using that funding that um, uh, eventually will be released uh, from the federal government. Okay. Um, another person asked saying that they have seen ads stating that uh, high blood pressure affects more African-American people um, and diabetes affects more uh, Hispanics or Latinx, uh, Latinx. Could this be due to the stress level by the poverty, nourishment, and inequity that exists in our society rather than race? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's the, the exact right take home there is that what you see when you see that is, is the disparity or the kind of outcome or symptom of structural racism. And so it goes back to what was the stress levels of mothers or birthing persons at birth uh, and how did that impact the, the child's arrival into the world? What was the nutrition levels growing up? Did they have consistent access to food? Did they have access to shelter and safety so they weren't feeling stressed or feeling like uh, the floor was gonna, rug was gonna be pulled out from underneath them? Did they then have access to education which provide them to get an, uh, a, a, you know into college or get to a job that pays well so that they continue to have access to good food where their safety areas in their neighborhood so they could play and exercise and grow up? Do they have access to nutritious food in their neighborhoods? Um, and so we could go on and on about environmental toxins from pollution that can also impact you know, rates of uh, chronic diseases as well. But all that is to say that when you see those increased incidences, it's not because of the color of my skin that I'm more at risk. It's because of the opportunity that and how our society has structured that opportunity uh, for folks on a population level that look like me um, or not. And probably the last question we have time for, um, are there plans to look at medical school curriculum to determine how to address racism in medical setting? Absolutely. And so there's been a lot of movement with that. Um, Dr. Brooke Cunningham uh, has been one of our local leaders that has really been pushing that with uh, Dr. Rachel Hardiman uh, for several years um, and uh, was recently named as a leader in the University of Minnesota's medical school to that extent. And so, and there's um, ongoing development of, of improving that piece of it as well and starting at medical school, but we really need to do it through all levels of training um, as well. And so having conversations with our residency uh, and fellowship um, programs on how they're integrating it is, is uh, ongoing as well. Okay, I think we could squeeze in one more. Um, have you or others working at DHS uncovered strategies or narratives that are helpful to address positive health practices for the communities discussed today, such as extending duration of breastfeeding, improving vaccination rates, and so on? Maybe we don't have much time for that. strategies and narratives. Um. So yeah, I I I think a lot of it it's you, there's some overlap with what we're seeing with vaccination, right? Is that having the messenger matters, and so um you know really partnering and thinking of what are the different ways to get messages into the community, and so I'll just speak to an effort I've been a part of as far, part of the Minnesota Association of African American Physicians, uh, who for um, several years under Dr. Uh, Charles Crutchfield's leadership has done uh, regular columns in the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, which is the traditionally African American publication in the Twin Cities. And uh, they've just always been putting just general you know, topics of, of, of interest and of health and just giving the, the guidance in that setting. And so uh, then when COVID comes, that's a group that has already been engaged with the community and so can continue to provide information um, and be that trusted source. And I think similarly, you know, finding who are the you know, trusted messengers and working with them to see how they you know, could either help with your message or maybe inform your message um, as well. And so I think that that's one example um, uh, that, uh, that could, I think, uh, be applied there. Great. Well, <laughs> those of us in Minneapolis can hear the sirens telling us that it's one o'clock, so we should be respectful of everyone's time and sign off. So um, you can find the links on this, uh, this last slide, and you'll also receive a follow-up email for participating today. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Chomolo. We really appreciate your, your insights and your expertise, and thank you everyone for attending today.